Hello, my name's David Broussard. Welcome to the Office 365 Bootcamp. In this episode, we're gonna talk about security and compliance in Office 365. The well, first thing we wanna talk about today is something that Microsoft has recently released. It's called the Secure Score Analyzer. What this does is look at your Office 365 tenant and gives you a composite score of your security in your Office 365 tenant. Not only that, it also provides you with guidance on how to improve your security score as you uh, evolve your tenant. So let's go ahead and pop over to the Admin Center, which is how you'll get to this. If you look on the Admin Center, there is a button down here in, uh, for the Security and Compliance section inside the Admin Centers. If you fire that off, it's gonna actually open up the Security and Compliance Center, and right up here at the top, there's a section called What's New, the Office 365 Secure Store. Now, I've already gone ahead and opened that up for my particular tenant, and it's gonna come and tell you a little bit about the Secure Store, and you can read through those things, and it's gonna tell you what your score is. So the score for this demo tenant is actually 37 out of 257, and that sounds pretty bad, but in actuality, it's not so bad. As I look down here, you'll see that the max score is 430 and my current score is 37. And I can go ahead and set a target score of where I want to go and it even it provides me the actions I should take to get there. It also points out to me, as you'll see, that while I have a score of 37, the Office 365 average score is 29. So I'm actually more secure than most Office 365 tenants. What's nice about this is it shows me all of these different actions that I can take. Things like enabling multi-factor authentication for all global admins, or enabling multi-factor authentication for all users. All of these things I can do to improve the security inside of my Office 365 tenant. So the first thing you wanna think about when you're talking about security and compliance in Office 365 is going out to the Secure Store Analyzer and finding out what your security score is, and then looking at those actions and deciding which ones you actually want to implement inside your organization. There are some considerations we want to think about when we look about when we think about security and compliance inside of Office 365. The first one is making sure that we've got the correct authentication model for our organization. If you you have a number of options here. Number one, you can use cloud authentication. Everybody is logging in and logging in with their with their accounts that's stored in the cloud with their identity and their password there. You can use um, directory synchronization, which is going to take your Active Directory user accounts and migrate copies of them out to Office 365 with a hash of the password. In that situation, you're actually managing your identity on premise, but you're moving a copy of that with the hash word pass, the, the, the password hash out in the cloud. That way, when somebody logs into Office 365, they're utilizing the same password as they would normally use on the network. One of the downsides of that is there is a limitation on how fast you go ahead and do that replication. It could be as short as 15 minutes, it could be once a day, and so if you make a change to a user, like change their password or disable them, it takes a little bit of time for that to propagate out to Office 365. The third option is one called um, Act Active Directory Federated Services. In that situation, Dersync actually copies the identity out to the cloud, but it does not copy the password hash. When somebody logs into Office 365, they are actually redirected back to what's called a secure token server, which is an Active Directory Federation web proxy that's running either in Azure or in your network that is actually going to handle the authentication of the user. In addition to those three types of authentication, you can also use the built-in multi-factor authentication that Microsoft provides, and we'll demonstrate that a little bit later. Other things we think about are ensuring that only the right people see information. And so in that, we're going to want to take our security groups from Active Directory. We're going to want to propagate them out to Office 365 as security groups. Or we're going to want to create security groups in Office 365 and use that to help secure our information inside of our organization. We also want to make sure that information is protected from oversharing. That means we want, to, we want to control who people are allowed to share with. Do we let them share with everybody outside the organization? Or do we let the people share anonymously? Or do we restrict that? Can they do that in SharePoint? Can they do that in OneDrive? We also want to be able to audit and know who has access to our information. We want to make sure that information is preserved so that it's not deleted and we don't lose it too soon. And lastly, in cases of certain legal and compliance reasons, we may be able to go out and find information. We need to be able to pull that off into an area, uh, into a case hold, and be able to provide that to an external party like a law firm or a court when we, have, when we have a legal hold or a compliance hold. So 
Let's hop over here and take a look at a number of these in sequence. The first thing we'll take a look at is, let's take a look at multi-factor authentication. So to get to multi-factor authentication, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go select a user. And so in my case, I'll go ahead and select myself. And here is my account. And what I can do here is I can go down and actually uh, at the very bottom, there's a section for more settings. And it says I can manage my multi-factor authentication. And if I click on that, it's gonna actually take me over to the Azure Active Directory um, management area. And here I can actually set up the settings for who has multi-factor authentication. And I can go down and identify a user. In this case, I'll go ahead and select myself again. And then what I can do is I can actually enable that multi-factor authentication. What will happen then is it's going to force me to actually either uh, have a text message sent to me or answer a phone call, or I can also use the Microsoft Authenticator app to generate a code that I will then type into the system. So in addition to having my user ID and password, I'm going to have a second token I have to put in uh, to validate that I am who I say I am. And this is a great, especially for your global admins, this is very important to have this set up. For people who aren't global admins, we will often turn multi-factor authentication on when we think that their uh, credentials may have been uh, compromised. So that's something that we can, we can do as well. So going back to our Compliance Center, what are some other things that we can do over here? The Compliance Center also allows us to take a look at things like alerts. I can actually set up alerts about common things that happen inside my organization. For example, I can go out and create what are called activity alerts. And you can see I've already created one called Anonymous Link. And if I open up this Anonymous Link alert and we take a look at it, we'll see that I've, I've just said shared anonymously. It's a custom alert type. And whenever any user uses uh, use an anonymous link, then I want to send an alert to some email address. So I can actually go out and add more of these. I can say checked in a file, checked out a file. I can say unshared a file created an anonymous link, removed an anonymous link, accepted an access request. I can set up whenever I'm setting up synchronization activities, site administration activities like deleted a group or created a group. Um, I can even go down and set up exchange mailbox activities, uh, sway activities, um, user administration activities like added a user. This enables me to set up a series of alerts to monitor when things are happening inside my organization. One of the problems that people run into right now is with ad hoc collaboration especially, groups, teams, things like that, and the, and the Yammer group integration, we don't know when groups are being created. You could set up an alert that sends an email to you or to a, a, a specific account whenever a group gets created. That way you could then set a timer on that that says, hey, three months after that group's been created, I need to go back and check to make sure that group is still being used. This is one way that we could actually improve our governance and use the tools that Microsoft gives us to make that work a little bit better. So that's alerts. Let's take a look at the next thing we have down on here. Let's talk about data, gover um, data governance. Underneath data governance, we have an area for retention. What retention allows us to do is to create policies to make sure that emails and files aren't deleted before they're supposed to be. So some of these I can manage retention tags for mailboxes and retention policies for mailboxes. Um, this stuff is currently managed in the Exchange Management Console, but over time those features and functionality are going to be rolled into this particular console and all of it will be managed inside the Security Compliance uh, Console in the future. Same thing is true of the document deletion policies for SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business. Lastly, I can create these preservation policies, which can let me preserve emails and documents and conversations uh, if they're changed or deleted. And so by creating one of these policies, I can give it a name like uh, do not delete important things. And I'll just come down here and say stuff. And as I click through here, it says, where do you want us to look for this pre preservation policy? Is it just mailboxes? which is my email and my Skype for Business conversations? Do I want to look in SharePoint Online and OneDrive for Business sites? Do I want to look in public folders? Well, I'll go ahead and say I want to look in mailboxes and I want to look in SharePoint Online and OneDrive. And then it's going to say, hey, which mailboxes do you want me to include? If, and so I can go through now and say I want to go out and look for a whole bunch of mailboxes. I'm just going to go ahead and select myself. In this case, I'm going to grab myself and add myself. Uh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and get Jeff Dalton as well because I want to know what he's up to. And so there he is, and I'll go ahead and add him. And so now the two of us are going to be searched. 
our mailboxes. Which sites do we want to include? And now I can go out here and, and actually put out the URL if I want to. And so I'll go ahead and say uh, catsysdemo.sharepoint. Okay, and so I'll go ahead and put that in there. And then I'll go ahead and go on here. Now I can say, what do I want to look for? What specific uh, keywords do I actually want to go out and look for? If I leave it blank, it'll find everything. But let's say I go out over here and I'm going to look for SharePoint. I'm going to look for the word SharePoint. Okay, And that's a keyword that I want to look for. And maybe I'll go ahead and also look for OneDrive. And I'll look for email. And so what it's going to do is it's going to look for those emails inside of here. And then I can actually go out and set when do I want this to start? Right now or do I want to go back in time? So then I can set the start date that I want for this. So I can go ahead and say either right now or I want to go back in time. I'll go back to January 1st of this year. And if I don't set an end date, then it will look forever. I'll go ahead and set the date as the end date is today. And then I can hit the next button and say how long do I want to preserve this content? By default, it will preserve it forever. But I could go out there and say I want to keep it for 10 years or 7 years. I'll go ahead and say for 6 months. And now I'll go ahead and say next. And if I turn on preservation lock, I won't be able to make any changes to this preservation except to add new users. I'll go ahead and say no so that I can go ahead and make changes to this. And then when I turn this on, it will go out and it will start preserving content for me. So I'll go ahead and create this rule. It's going to go out now and find emails, files in SharePoint and OneDrive that have, that have the keywords of SharePoint, OneDrive, or email inside of there. And it will make them so they are preserved and they can't be deleted. So this is a way that I can make sure that documents that are important to my organization, uh, and, and, and I will not have them actually get lost. Okay. Um, the next thing we'll take a look at is, under threat management, this concept of data loss prevention. Now, what is data loss prevention? Data loss prevention is different than the preservation. Preservation is about making sure, that, and retentions are making sure that documents don't get deleted that have already been created. Data loss prevention is about making sure that we create documents and they don't leave our organization if they contain proprietary information. So let's take a look at that. What we're talking about here is some, uh, some, some aspects around things like Let's say, I have a let's say that I have a bunch of documents that contain account numbers, or they contain social security numbers, or they contain credit card numbers. Um, I don't usually want those being sent outside my organization, because what I'm afraid of is I don't want somebody taking a list of hundreds of people or thousands of people with their PII, personal identifi identifiable information, and then emailing that to somebody outside the organization. So I can actually lock that down with data loss prevention. Now, what I'll do here is I'll go ahead and create a new DLP policy. So example, I've got financial regulations. And I can go down here and say, hey, what are some ones that are already built out for me? So example, I have one called US financial data. It helps determine the presence of information commonly considered to be financial information in the US, right? Things like routing numbers, credit card numbers, bank account numbers. And it's already designed to go out and look for all SharePoint Online sites or, and all OneDrive accounts. I can also turn on Exchange Online if I wanted to. And I can hit next, and what it's going to do now is it's going to let me go out and say, notice it has a low count and a high count. The low count is saying, how much of that information am I, am I, am I going to allow before I trigger a warning? And then the high count is saying, once I get to this level, when am I going to trigger action to be done? So as an example, if I take a look at this low count number and we edit it, it's currently set up to say, if I find one to nine credit card numbers, one to nine bank account numbers, or one to nine ABA routing numbers, and it's shared with people outside my organization, what am I going to do? I am going to send an email to the owner of the SharePoint site or OneDrive where the content is stored, the person who shared or emailed the last modified the content, and the owner of the SharePoint or OneDrive content, and I could even add additional people, and I could turn off some of these things. So as an example, I could set it up to where if somebody tries to send out a single credit card number, a single ABA number, I could warn them, hey, you're sending out information that is not allowed to be shared outside the organization, but we're not going to stop you from doing that because we're just warning you at this point in time. On the other hand, when I get to the high count side of things, which is defined as being 10 or more, in that situation, my at, what I'm going to do as well is I'm going to stop these things from actually being sent out. Okay? You'll notice also that I'm going to put a policy tip content out there, which means as I'm composing my email, it's actually going to warn me up in the top, by the way, 
this particular email falls under a sensitive uh, information policy and you aren't going to be able to send this outside the organization. Now notice, in this case down at the bottom, I can still allow the people who are getting the override information, uh, the, the notification, to actually override it and say, if they provide a business reason, we'll be able to override the rule. That's going to make them type in what the business reason is. Yes, I need to send these 5,000 credit card numbers to somebody for some reason. Okay? So all of this is, allow, is allowing us to identify certain types of information, whether it be credit card numbers, routing numbers, it can be your account numbers, it can be address information, um, it can be your part numbers. Those ways of identifying or digitally fingerprinting our documents, we can then use to prevent that from being sent outside of our organization. The last thing we'll take a look at is we'll take a look at the uh, search and investigation. And this allows us to go out and do a couple of things. The first thing is I can do an audit log search. An audit log search has enabled me to go out and see what people are doing in Office 365. So in this case, if I have a need to go out and know who's checked out a file, who's checked in a file, who has viewed a file, these are the kinds of things that I can go out and look for. I can look at these activities and you can see all of these things like downloaded a file. I can actually go out and find any time somebody has actually downloaded a file or um, uploaded a file. And then what I can do is I can say, hey, when do I want to start this? I'll go back to January 1st of this year, and I'll go to today, and I'll show results for all users, and then I can hit search. Now what it's going to do is it's going to go out and find all of the instances of times when, I either, when a, a file was downloaded or a file was uploaded into the system and give me a, a report around that. Now, how can I use that? If I'm curious as to who has access to specific information, this is a way for us to be able to track that information and find out. And you can see on here, I get the date, I get the IP address, I get the user, I get the activity, I get the, uh, the item that was actually downloaded, and I can see that throughout my entire organization. So if I need to go find out what happened to a specific uh, item or what a specific user has been doing, I can go out and pull these audit log reports and find out what people are actually doing inside my organization. The other thing we can do inside of search and investigation is I can actually do what's called an e-discovery. What e-discovery can do is I can go out and create cases in which I can go out and look at, um, find information that matches certain keywords, like for example, a customer that we have, or a product, or a case number that we have from our system. And then what I'll be able to do is look everywhere, all of my email, all of my SharePoint, all of my OneDrive, find all of the instances of that data and pull it out, and then I can use that to bring it out to a shared drive or burn it to a DVD so I can provide it to a court of law and make sure that we're okay. Lastly, you've got your reports down here, which gives you a dashboard. This is going to tell you things like how many DLP policy matches you're actually getting and how many false positives you're getting out there. You can see we're not really getting any traffic right now because this is a demo environment. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you very much.